Yeah. One of my favorite movies, The Holiday, with Cameron Diaz. I don't know if I've seen it. The two Maybe. women switch places, switch homes for the holidays. Cameron Diaz is oh. in like a LA house. Oh, it's like a Christmas movie, I think, or yep. something. Okay. Switches with a woman Vagary. in London. Okay. Or it's in like rural England somewhere. Okay. And she gets together with this woman's brother while okay. she's there. And one of the things that Cameron Diaz says in this in this clip in this film is he asks her what her thoughts are on foreplay. And she says, it's overrated. And he's basically like, oh my God, you're the woman of my dreams. Oh. And it's so benign and it's so yeah. quick and it's so brief in this holiday movie yeah. that we don't that even realize in. that that sinks yes. in to our psyche. Oh, that we're attractive if we don't need a lot of foreplay. Yes. That like, if we're ready to go right out of the gate. Yeah. Well, then you're not. A, then that's not better. A, we're not know. high. We're not high maintenance. Right. Right. So it's just. So we said. I said a lot by couples. We're all high maintenance. We're <laughs> yeah. all pins in the asses. So sorry, not sorry, but they don't get fun about being high maintenance. It's just the way it is. Absolutely. But man, you're so true. Like there's so many little mm-hmm. messages like that that we yeah. don't think yeah. affect us. Yep. Yeah. And they those just sink into our system, and then you're like, oh yeah. yes. And then think about if we're adults. Think about the kids or the young, the teenagers watching that. They're like, oh noted. Oh noted. Oh noted. Right, all those messages. Mm-hmm. Welcome to the Relationship Psychologist Podcast. Tune in every Thursday to learn with us as we interview experts. And laugh with us as we banter about friendship. And take action by implementing the tools and advice we provide to you each week to level up your personal relationships. I'm Dana Mullen. And I'm Alicia Hinger. We are soul sisters, besties, and psychologists on a mission to change the culture of relationships. Your journey to becoming more supported and connected starts right, right now. now. Kelsey, <laughs> after all that, welcome. We're trying to navigate around dogs and offices and not working podcast equipment. So here we are. Yay. We're recording. We're live. Excellent. Um, so yeah, I'm into everybody heard your pelvic health floor, pelvic floor health. Which way do I say that? Pelvic floor physiotherapist okay. works or pelvic floor therapist, because we actually do have occupational therapists who do pelvic floor health as well. I don't know that. Mm-hmm. Oh, what's the difference? mostly just the background where we're coming from this training for pelvic health is the same in the sense that we learn how to assess and diagnose different pelvic floor conditions but a not physiotherapist is coming from that physiotherapy background maybe a little bit more physical focus right occupational mm-hmm. therapy coming at it from the occupational perspective in the sense that like under the definition of occupational sex is an occupation and they're what? helping with like sexual health they're helping with toileting they're helping with oh i see okay probably health in that sense yeah <laughs> i'm like you're helping prostitutes <laughs> no well, sorry I mean, there's anything wrong with that let's help them the ot's but... out there are like oh my god that's not <laughs> what we need <laughs> <laughs> when they work on occupational therapy they work on anything like sort of activities of daily living things that are meaningful in gotcha. someone's life and so they <laughs> they sort of define an occupation the lay person like, like any of those things <laughs> Define what you're saying. Yes, fair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're talking about sex, people. Today, clearly, <laughs> this is going to be fun. <laughs> okay, so you and I've had a few times to chat in different um, capacities, um, doing like a presentation with a previous women's group we did, and then we actually met at a different talk I was giving at a mom's group. I think that you were, yeah, in which we first met. So, um, so I think our paths actually cross. Like every time I hear you and see you, and I'm like, dang, we got to talk about this because our paths cross so much more than we even think. So let's start with that. Like I think people come and see me in my office, and we talk about marriage and, and relationships, and obviously sex comes into my office, you know, a lot, like ninety percent of the time, it's part of our conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, but like we've, you know, I've said before with you, or you said before to me that there's a disconnect between the mental health you know, the emotional health and the physical, but that's a separate thing over there. And it's really not. Yeah. It's they're They all kind of hang out in the same bubble. So tell me kind of from your perspective, um, what you see in your office um, and how you think those kind of those, those areas kind of blend together. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's an entire systemic thing. I think our healthcare system was sort of laid out in a way that we put physical health over here in one yeah. category, doctors, nurses, physios, occupational therapists, chiropractors, um, massage therapists, the works. And then we address that like biomedical, we're taught from a biomedical model, like find the source root cause of the pain, hate that word. Yeah. Um, And then treat. And what happens then is that when school we're taught to identify psychosocial stuff as if it's a red flag to improvement, but not our problem, not our scope. Right. And so what happens then is that if there are psychosocial contributors to someone's symptoms, they're sort of like written off, right? We can't fix you. We don't know what to do for you. So we're just going to send you to psychology and that's it. I'm done. Right. Right. 
And so what happens is we have this huge disconnect. We have this mental health category over yeah. here and this physical health category over here when they should be intersected in every way. Yeah. Cause I they're agree. both related. Yeah. I agree. One of the things you said that blew my mind in the talk that, you, that we did together is you said, I'm going to plagiarize your words or somehow, but it's essentially <laughs> that when you said, when a, especially a female, like a Volvo owner gets stressed, that's what gets, you know, um, tight and dysfunctional first. And I was like, I think my jaw or my shoulders and you're like Mm-mm, pelvic floor. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. So uh, they did some really interesting research and it was mostly on Volvo owners, um, those who identified as women. And it mostly just, I don't think any men wanted to volunteer for this. No. <laughs> yeah. And they tested muscle activity throughout the body and they looked at the neck, the shoulders, the jaw, the abdomen, the low back, the yeah, thighs. The things we think are the you know common yep, ones. Totally. And the pelvic floor. And what they found was that in 100% of the participants across the board, when they were faced with something stressful, they were shown various movies and videos, is that when they saw stress, fear, um, danger, that kind of stuff, the pelvic floor was the first muscle group in the body to get tight every time. Mind-blowing. Every time. Mind-blowing. And interesting, they had kind of two cohorts. And so they had one group who had not had any unwanted sexual contact in their lifespan. And then they had a group cohort that did. Okay. And it was more pronounced in that group. Of course. Yeah, not which surprising. Makes, which it makes sense. Yeah. And so, yeah, we all talk about stress and we talk about the neck, the shoulders, the jaw. We wake up in the morning and go like, oh, my mm -hmm. neck is so yeah. stiff and I'm feeling kind of extra stressed today. You need to get a massage. You need to get a massage, right? And they don't realize, and a lot of us are unaware of what our pelvic floor is doing. Yeah. And that's a whole other, yes. <laughs> that's a whole other category, yes. but they're unaware. And when they start to recognize it, they're like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, my pelvic floor is tight when I'm under stress too. Yeah. And it's causing problems with my bladder and my bowels and my sexual function. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we're going to get into that. We're going to dive right into that. We're just going to skip all these <laughs> questions and dive right into the good stuff. <laughs> Cause I'm working with, you know, the sexual health, um, specialist, um, like in my sex coach lady, I talked, I talk about her all the time. And one of the things she's having me do is like, pay attention to that. So like pre-orgasm, post-orgasm, feel the difference, wait for your clitoral bulbs to eng engorge, see what that feels like. And I'm kind of mind blown all the things my body can do that I'm like, I knew it could do some cool stuff, but I had no idea it could do that much stuff with different orgasms. We talked about that before. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's back up into, again, the things that we tend to hear first. Um, and even as people listening, again, my mind's like, okay, so you, you come in with, you know, stress work stress, marital stress, kids stress, life stress, financial stress, whatever stress, mm -hmm. but you said watching a, a scary movie causes stress. And then you're wondering, and we tend to go, Oh, we're not having, you know, satisfying or a healthy or, you know, great sex life because of maybe it's a relationship issue. However, it could just be the stress in your life that's causing things to be dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. So let's walk through that stuff first. Like what do you see as, as the physical dysfunction that you see that come through your office? Cause I hear both on my office, but I can't treat them the same way you can. And then what are some things you can, people can do um, to help alleviate some of those pains. Yeah. So the first thing I think is also like recognizing what's related to each other. Yeah. Because when someone comes into my office, I talk a lot about the nervous system and I talk yeah. about stress and I talk about what happens when we're in that fight flight nervous system response. Yeah. And here is the sort of, yeah, well, okay. We know that stress can ignite the fight flight nervous system check. Yeah. We know that anxiety and depression can do that. But now here's the physical yeah. consequences of yes. what happens in the body when that's happening. Yes. Excellent. And a lot don't realize that like bladder leakage can be linked to stress, linked to stress, right. that they come in and they're told automatically, oh, I'm having bladder leakage. My pelvic floor is weak. I need to do Kegels. I yeah. need to strengthen. Yeah. And so often people come into me and I'm like, no, that's not the problem. And you've tried Kegels in the past. They've done nothing for yeah. you. A lot of people are doing them incorrectly anyway, but a lot of times what's happening is the pelvic floor is tight. Okay. And that's what's leading right. to this poor coordination with the bladder or constipation concerns or pain with intercourse, um, pain with bladder, pain yeah. emptying our bladder. Yeah. Sy symptoms that mimic UTIs that aren't UTIs. Interesting. Really interesting stuff. And basically anything related to the pelvis, bladder issues, bowel issues, sexual health stuff, that's our wheelhouse. Yeah. That's what pelvic floor physiotherapists, pelvic floor occupational therapists do. So how do you help someone alleviate the stress in their pelvic floor? Mm -hmm. How do you stretches? Is there breathing things you can do? Yeah, absolutely. So I help to kind of teach them first, like find out exactly what their muscle function is doing. Okay. Right. So what is it doing? Is it too tight? Is it weak? Does it need strengthening? And like I said, a lot of people out there, they're too tight. They don't need Kegels. So we tell them, that's it. You're done. No more. Right. <laughs> Stop doing that. How do they know? 
because doctors was like, gave it all of us. I'm sure you too, after a baby. Yeah. Your Kegels. I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <You're a Kegel. laughs> so I, t- I teach people to kind of look for the signs and symptoms of that overactive pelvic floor. So if you have bladder leakage, um, and you have discomfort with sex or constipation or overactive bladder tendencies where you're peeing really frequently mm-hmm. through the day, then consider the fact that your pelvic floor might be too tight. Okay. And when I say that to people too, a lot of them are like, Oh yeah. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Partners have told me how tight I am and how great that is. Mm-hmm. And I find it uncomfortable and I don't like it. Or, um, that's a whole myth. Is it not? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I mean, here we're talking about vulva owners here, but two, same thing. Um, men who have bladder concerns are taught like do a Kegel, right. Tighten up, uh, pretend you're stopping urine. Okay. And it's like, when you really get to talking to them, it's like, they're not emptying their bladder well. They feel right. like they have to strain in order to empty it. They um they don't uh they don't have great sexual function. They're right. having erectile dysfunction or they're ejaculating too quickly. And we look at their pelvic floor, same thing. And so as they're tightening up their pelvic floor health by doing the Kegel exercises that they're doing, it's actually making it worse potentially. Yes, potentially. Wow. At best it's doing nothing. And at worst, it's actually making it worse. Wow. Well, yeah. They're still suffering at the same time. Yeah. So we do a physical exam of the pelvic floor muscles, right. which is usually a vaginal or rectal exam or both if necessary. And actually like give, show them, show them what that means when the pelvic floor is holding onto tension right. tight. Does not mean strong? No. And we need to work on the tension first. Right. Okay. Yeah. And do you get things they can do at home? Yeah. So things that you can teach our audience that are listening, give more things to try, like uh, kind of gentle and simple. And yeah, um, I find, I guess one of the first ways to sort of look at tension in our pelvic floor is also to look at tension in the stomach. Okay. If we're holding tension through here, we're likely holding tension down there. Okay. Um, and so one of the first things I will teach people is like, we have to let go of tension here. Right. There's a reason that we don't wear corsets anymore. <laughs> Some still do. Right. <laughs> There's a reason why we don't have a bone between our rib cage and our pelvis. This is supposed to be soft. Um, Let it be soft, right? This idea that back pain is linked to a weak core and we need to, we need to strengthen it. This idea. I was just told that recently. Yeah. Because I have a lower back that kind of goes out once in a while. And they were like, that has been so debunked. Interesting. I guess so told, I won't say by who, research. but we have to stop. We have to wow. stop as, as physical professionals, physiotherapists, chiropractors. I'm wow. telling you, we have to stop that narrative. It's harmful. There are so many people. I was told that I was told that when I was 60 pounds lighter and a varsity level swimmer yeah. that my core was weak. There yeah. was nothing like I ride horses, about my core. Are weak, but okay, I'll keep working on my abs. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And here I am like eight months postpartum and my core is probably the weakest it's ever been. I don't have any back pain. Not anymore. Wow. I've done other things to work on it. I've learned to let go through here. I've learned to breathe through my diaphragm. Um, so breathing It's supposed to be soft. And I remember like, as a, I remember the first time I was ever told to suck my stomach and I'm pretty sure I was about 12 years old. Yeah. I was told that I was standing with my gut hung out and I should stop doing that. Right. It's an aesthetic thing. Right. It's particularly aesthetic for women. Yeah. We should have good posture, yeah. upright, suck the stomach and guys, we might as well put books back on our heads again. Right. <laughs> Okay. So posture their shoulders, is that still good for your back to like sit shoulders back? So you don't have a rounded shoulder. Not necessarily. Interesting. Sitting slumped is comfortable. Yeah. There's a reason we like it. There's a reason we default to it. Should we be in that position for eight hours a day? Right. No, no. But should we be in this position for eight hours a day? Also? No. Right. <laughs> Dang. We're breaking all the myths. Here. I know. I know. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. So Kegels is there, are they still useful? Yeah. Should we still be doing those? I just like think I do the thing to do those all the time. <laughs> As a general rule of thumb, um, 80% of people are doing them incorrectly if they're <laughs> doing them on their own and have never been taught. Okay, well, I've never been taught. So teach me how to do them properly. So <laughs> that, that involves an internal exam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm in. I'm in. So um, one of the things that we will say as public physios is like, honestly, if you've been trying them and they're not doing anything for you, then they're probably not effective. They're either not appropriate for you or you're doing them wrong. Okay. How do you know so they're effective? Getting, get, really have... Well, if you had <laughs> symptoms, you would, they'd be getting okay. better. And if you don't, then it's kind of like, it's kind of like doing exercises for like rehabbing a shoulder. Like That's the idea so that every single person should be doing Kegels and they should be doing them for the, their lifespan is, is nonsense. Like that's okay. also not true. Throw There's the Kegel ball. Plenty of people that go their life without doing Kegels that don't have problems. And so the idea that every single person should be doing them is also false. So here's my like little background story of why I think that. So um, my grandmother's passed. So I probably can embarrass her story, but she's lovely, but she had by like, birth, like 13 children. And so her uterus mm-hmm. usually would fall out. So she had to put a ring in there to hold things in. So as a kid, I remember being like, I don't want that to happen. I'm keeping that stuff tight and strong. Cause I don't want stuff to be falling out later on in my life. Right. <laughs> but obviously maybe that's not serving me. 
And maybe it is. It really, it has to be so individualized. So some people come in and they do, they have weakness in their pelvic floor muscles. Their tone in their muscles is not elevated and too tight. It's a little bit too relaxed. Right. We do need Kegels and strengthening to improve that. Okay. But I would say that the assumption is that anybody who's had a child is going to have a vagina like that, right? This, this idea that loose is what's happening after we have children. And that's absolute nonsense. Some people can have that laxity before they've ever been pregnant. Some people can have it after, and some people can be too tight after, right? Right. So again, just like just dropping the assumptions that automatically every single person should, should be doing these. And then, um, and then when we're doing them, we want to make sure that, yeah, we're doing them correctly. Right. And not only are we learning to tighten, but we also know how to let go all the way. Right. So mm-hmm. that we're not doing bicep curls like this. Right. Halfway. Yeah. We're letting it all the way down. We're pulling it all the way in. So we're doing it like adequately and through its full range of motion. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm here. We need all book a session with you, an internal exam to see our muscles to see how they're looking what's it actually doing what's actually yeah. doing yep interesting absolutely and so what else can that affect so bladder potentially lower back mm-hmm. breathing lower back pain breathing obviously sex pain yep those are kind of the common ones people come in for yep. and if you don't have those things it's still a good idea maybe to get an assessment to see just kind of a baseline of where things well are physios at. love prevention okay anything that we can do to potentially prevent so okay. sometimes people will fill out my intake form and they might actually realize through that questioning that okay hang on a minute i do have maybe a little bit of overactive bladder tendencies. Maybe I pee just in case a little too often. Um, And even though I'm not leaking, it's still maybe like early indicators that if we address now, while it's easy to address, it doesn't become a problem long-term. So physiotherapists, I mean, we love prevention. We love to see people anyway, even if you don't have major concerns. Okay. Same as that. So yeah, so we should look in for a check-in. Exactly. (laughs) So, okay. Let's see. Um, you have someone in your office, men or women, whoever comes to your office and they have some pain or sexual, you know, issue with their sex life with their partner. How do you go about teaching them with their, to, to, I guess, to like use their words and use their communication to teach their partner about what's happening really? Because I feel still feel like much as we talk about sex, you and I do all the time. Um, mm-hmm. It's still a very, like I had a client yesterday, literally, and I was talking to her about sex with her boyfriend and she was like, I've never talked about this before. And she's hiding her face on the couch. And I'm like, you're you're a sexually active adult. You mm-hmm. should need to be talking about these things with your partner who's in the room with you. Mm-hmm. So it's still a very kind of hide, don't talk about it. Not everyone, but I see it a lot. I'm sure you yeah. do too. Yeah. Um, so what's your advice to people listening to talk to their partners and like we could both <sighs> in here, but this is always a tough one. Yeah. There's so many times where we strategize, we talk about like what needs to be discussed. And then they come back to me on the next visit and they haven't done it yeah. yet. Right. They don't like, they don't have necessarily the guts to do it. So sometimes what I do is I get them to work on their own stuff first. Yeah. So like, are you, do you feel shame about sex? Do you feel shame about your body? Is there ways that we can improve that? Um, and then I give them like stuff that they can like watch or read or listen to. Right. And I ask them what they prefer. Do they like to listen to podcasts as, as Do they like to read books? Do they like to watch videos? Like what's their preference? And then I give them resources and I say like, you can watch this on your own and you can include your partner. Right. Right. So like there's a a fantastic docu-series on Netflix, Principles of Pleasure. Oh, I love that one. It. One of my yes. favorites. Okay. Features Emily Nagoski. Okay. And a couple of those professionals. Okay. That I love her. Do yeah. a lot of sex. I her books. Yeah. 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 Really great. Yeah. Really, really eye opening. Um, and so I give it to them as homework. And I'm like, okay, like watch it first, watch it by yourself, or include your partner right out of the gate. Yeah. Right. You can just say, hey, this looks like a cool thing on Netflix to watch, and then just watch it. They don't yeah. even need to know that you learned that in therapy. Right. <laughs> happened to be on the Netflix. Happened oh, to be there. <laughs> like, let's check this out. Yeah. Um, I will usually say that like life changes can really help open the yeah. door for that. Yeah. And so postpartum is a really awesome time. Yeah. And I'll say to particularly our vulva owners and our women that it's a really great time to open the dialogue to say, this used to work for me. Yeah, it didn't. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And now it doesn't anymore. And so it's a nice place to open the dialogue to say, we're hitting a reset on the sex life when we resume sex postpartum. Yeah. And or post surgery or Mm -hmm. whatever that might be. It's like, if there's that kind of life change or something happens, hit a reset button on the sex life and start over start from the beginning again and then they have a little bit of an easier time because sometimes the nervousness is my partner has been doing something that I don't actually really like that much and they've been doing that for years that we've been together and now how do I tell them that I don't actually like it that much yeah yeah without hurting their ego yeah and without people getting defensive and upset yeah right 
And I got to say, I find, so in my office, I have them in here and I give them that exact same advice and they're always nervous to tell their partner their truth. Mm-hmm. But 99% of the time, I'll have one person sometimes that will have a reaction. Most of the time, the partner's like, well, thanks. For, I'm glad you told me. Like they're yeah. usually, they're your partner for a reason. They're usually really bought into a pleasure experience together. And so if I'm doing something that you're not like, if I'm cooking food that you're hating all the time and you just eat the food that you... I just rather you tell me I'll make it something else. Totally. Like it's, yeah, yeah. it's usually not that big of a deal. At least in my office, I've, I usually see relief. On, and then the person that's like, I've been holding up 25 years. And the other guys, you know, whoever is like, well, yeah, sorry. You should tell me because I would have changed it really quick. Cause I want to give pleasure to you as well. Yes. The two way street here. Huge. Yeah. It's like, we're embarrassed to like newly discover our body and newly, yeah. like we don't have the time. We don't even know what we like or don't like. And so we're exploring that. And we're nervous and we're afraid to tell our partner, but like when you do, they're excited. They're excited. They're excited yeah. about it. They're very excited. You're making active steps towards improving your sex life. Yeah. Any good partner is going to be excited. About okay. That. Yeah. That's usually do that. Exactly. <laughs> so one of the things I do is like a simple technique and I, I do my version of like a sensate focus essentially, which is just mm-hmm. like doing with the hands. Yep. And so I'll, I'll have partners. I'll say, take intercourse off the table, take orgasm off the table. And I'll just even in here be like, okay, we're going to have sex. And they're both like, I'm like, just kidding. We're going to like put your hand together and just say, like, even you and I put our hands together and, like, and just like stop and like feel each other's fingertips and see where you can feel pleasure in your arm and just see what it feels like to touch each other's. And so we'll just do the, the smallest little intentions. And I'm like, okay, now I want you to go and you press the, press all the folds. And, and then you're telling each other, you know, pleasure. How does that feel? So I'm pleasuring you. I'm like, how does that feel? And you're like, you know, I like the curious in my armpit. Oh, but my ear, that feels really good. And so you're doing all the pleasure points, like a, like a really slow down, not intercourse, not traditional sex. But mm-hmm. Let's call this sex that's still intimate. And it's still between the two of you. And it's very, very personal. Like it's, for the, it's for your little bubble of your intimate you know, experience. And so I have them do like a, a series of kind of that, those exercises. And they usually come back being like, that was fun. What's next? I love and that. They work back up to. And then like we, in our which we did, we said, now I want you to create orgasm. What was that? I think I said without clitoris or G-spot. Mm. So now you can't use your go-to buttons. Let's do, you know, so we have to we work in it, but it gives you a chance to explore mm-hmm. each other's bodies. Slow and down. there's a chance to for that reset to be like, they're like, but this thing I always did, and you're like, oh, actually that's like a two on the two on the 10 scale. They're like, wow, I thought that was a 10. Now I'm, you know, the nine or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I get, love that. Yeah. I love how you say your own version of sensate focus. Cause I yeah. do that too. Okay. I do. Right? I do my own version of sensate focus. Yeah. I'm like, okay, we are taking any aspect of inter- intercourse um, off the table if yes. it's causing you anxiety or pain. Yeah. Period. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's not working. Yeah. Take that off the table for a bit. Right. And you just, someone's like, <gasps> I'm like, when did you think sex was just that? Yeah. That that's your, and then we know what the menus before. So like if you if sex is intercourse to you, we need to really expand your menu because lots of people have lots of really great sex that have nothing to do with intercourse. Yeah. So let's expand the menu. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. so giving these assignments that you give is, I love it. Helps to yeah. expand. I find too, especially if there's a pain component yeah. to sex, let the person experiencing the pain be the initiator for a bit. Yeah. Because a lot of times they're not the initiator. Yeah. The other partner is, and they're saying yes. Yes. Out of a sense of obligation yeah. or guilt. Yeah. Um, and a whole other topic. that might yeah. not be like a forced obligation. Yeah. That might be something that they've kind of put on themselves yeah. maybe, and maybe not, but that saying yes out of that, for that reason is not a good enough reason. Yeah. Right. So we, I usually say as part of that equation, if that person is experiencing anxiety or pain with intimacy, that they get to be the initiator. Yeah. For a short while. Yeah. Or just the receiver differently. Put that, you put that, those two elements together, initiator and, or, you know, they can set the box of being like, or they're the receiver and there's no intercourse. So how can you have, they receive pleasure. It's a massage. Yes. Can they receive yeah. pleasure of massage and can that be their pleasure practice for, with you guys right now? Totally. So receiving differently. But even what you just said, to what you just said, that the layers of belief systems, like the boxes we put around this mm-hmm. word called sex. Like yeah. We just talked about like the means of like sex isn't just intercourse, obviously. But even the beliefs of like, so why are you having sex again? Like, why are you doing that again? Yeah. What does that mean to you? What's your intended goals? What are your outcomes? Like yeah. all the like, and then when you actually like, if you are listening to this, I challenge you to like just pause. And even though I think I don't have layers, every time I do this assignment, I'm like, oh, there's another layer there. There's mm-hmm. a religious belief there. There's a you know a, a belief from parents or from school or from friends or from peers or from whatever movies mm-hmm. or like on start to peel back the layers of your belief yeah. systems around the topic of sex. Like, where did you first learn about it? What was your first introduction to the word and to the idea and to the right? Where'd you, where'd the, all of those things are going to affect your definition, yep. your belief, your lens that you wear around that topic. Yep. And then we get to choose now which lens we want to wear. There's yep. a lens I've been wearing for all this time. I didn't realize it. I was saying yes when I didn't want to, because I felt mm-hmm. what guilty or I felt yep. right. We can peel back those layers and have an adult conversation with our partner 
around those things. And this messaging, we don't even realize can be so benign. Yeah. One of my favorite movies, The Holiday with Cameron Diaz. I don't know if I've seen it. The two Maybe. women switch places, switch homes for the holidays. Cameron Diaz is oh. in like a LA house. Oh, it's like a Christmas movie, I think, or yep. something. Okay. Switches with a woman Vagary. in London. Okay. Or it's in like rural England somewhere. Okay. And she gets together with this woman's brother while okay. she's there. And one of the things that Cameron Diaz says in this in this clip, in this film, is he asks her what her thoughts are on foreplay. And she says, it's overrated. And he's basically like, oh my God, you're the woman of my dreams. Oh. And it's so benign. And it's so yeah. quick. And it's so brief in this holiday movie yeah. that we don't that even realize in. that that sinks yes. in to our psyche. Oh, that we're attractive if we don't need a lot of foreplay. Yes. That like, if we're ready to go right out of the gate. Yeah. Well, then you're not, a, then that's not a, better. Human. We're not high. We're not high maintenance. Right. Right. So it's just, so we said that I said that a lot by couples. We're all high maintenance. <laughs> we're all pins on the asses. So sorry, not sorry, but they don't get the point about being high maintenance. It's just the way it is. Absolutely. But man, you're so true. Like there's so many little mm-hmm. messages like that that we don't think yeah. affect us. Yep. Yeah. And they, those just sink into our system. And then you're like, oh, yeah. yes. And then think about, if we're adults, think about the kids or the young, the teenagers watching that. They're like, oh, noted. Oh, noted. Oh, noted right? All those messages. Mm-hmm. And the fact is, I mean, you know, this better than anybody. The fact is it takes what 10 minutes ish, or I don't know what the timeline is for the bulbs even to fill up, like to, to be engorged for a woman, for a vulva owners. They take some time. Mm-hmm. So there's no right out of the gate. Yeah. Even for a man, maybe it happens a little faster and they can tell when they're just engorged and ready, mm-hmm. but women, it takes some time as well. Yeah. And so it does. It's part of that process. What yeah. is, how long, what's the kind of the, is there a timeline or a I don't think there general? is. I think it's the same thing as an erection. There's like, it takes for, some time. For for some work. Yeah. It takes time. Um, and we're also not like the idea of like responsive versus spontaneous arousal. Right. Is that typically vulvar owners don't have as much spontaneous arousal. Right. As our penis owner right. counterparts um <laughs> it's a joke in my office right the last couple it's like you know because you know it's the joke and i was you know say that you know how often do you think about your penis and the guy's like i'm like you can be honest we're in my office I'm, they're like i don't know like a hundred times a day and their hands are in their pants twice three times four times a day like that's just that's just common for them mm-hmm. and i'll look at the time how much you think about your your vagina or your vulva they're like never what how much time you think about sex in a day the guy's like 300 times a day you know wife's like again like, this is being very general but yeah. it's a joke in the office because it's not that far off yeah there's usually yeah. one person and it's typically the penis owners that think about it i have mm-hmm. son i'm raising bo- you know i got boys in my house that walk around with their hands in their pants yeah do girls my girls do that or no <laughs> yeah. it's just a different way so yeah and culturally we approach it differently too yes right like how many out there look at it right or they come to me at postpartum and say like oh my god it looks like so it's such a mess down yeah. there and i'm like what are you comparing it to did you look with a mirror yeah. prior to having children no well, what are you comparing it to yeah. you don't even have a that could be exactly what it looked like before yeah yeah right so you never thought to look until your prenatal teacher yeah. said go look and i say as an example like if every single person out there went around with their ears covered yeah for for most for your whole life if <laughs> right. your ears were always always covered you never saw anybody else's ear and yeah. you never saw your own you never looked at it in a mirror you never looked at it at all you never touched it and then one day in your 20s all of a sudden you uncover yeah would you not think that this is a really weird looking organ right would you not think this is a really bizarre looking piece of our body yeah interesting yeah Vulvas are beautiful. Oh they're gosh, amazing. The and they're unique. They're so unique. That Every single person has a different looking one. We're as unique in that as we are in our faces. Amazing. But we don't look at it. We don't get to know it. We don't know when yeah. something's wrong. Our partners recognize when something's wrong before we do. Right. Right. For heteronormative couples. That video that you played in the in the talk that we gave, I don't know if it was yours or people can access that video, but it was beautiful. Like it mm-hmm. literally was like my heart was like, oh, it was a video of yeah. women vulva owners are uh, taking pictures with the photographer mm-hmm. and then they show the picture to them mm-hmm. and to their partners yeah and their their reactions to, to the partners were kind of like and the partners were like it's so cute or it's beautiful or oh i love that my wife or, i love that sexy record. it reminds me of oh. our children it reminds me of our life together it reminds me of this goosebumps and, yeah. yeah and then yep and the women are nervous and yeah. they're like shy, shy yeah. and ashamed yes and, you can see all, yeah. the, all the reactions yeah. are completely different and that's learned learned that's learned yes because my said- three-year-old gets their mirror out has a look mm-hmm. starts to name the parts yeah like you know this is not our mouth 
The yeah. same as this is not our vagina. Right. Yes. Thank there you. are so many Thank components you. and yes. parts. And she's learning to name those parts the same way she's learning to name eyebrows, eyelashes, yes. nose, nose, lips, yeah. teeth, tongue, um, because there's all these important aspects to it. Yeah. So let's just say that again. That's so important. This is not our mouth. This is our face with the nose and eyebrows and whatever cheeks of the yeah. stuff, right? This is not our vagina. vagina. Yes. It's not the cavity. Yes. Yes. That's one little, that's one small component of it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. One component. There's so many other, you know, what, so, have, so the vulva is kind of the word I used to call the whole thing. Is that yeah. kind of that the proper term? Yes. The vulva the is the equivalent word you can base, say. Yes. Right. Yeah. And then there's parts of the vulva. Right. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. so interesting. I love that you're a three-year-old. She's going to school a teacher in sex ed in grade four when they call the vagina. She's doing a it's not a vagina. Teachers. It's not a vagina. It's a vulva. <laughs> I, yep. love it. Yep. I love it already correcting I love, I love it. it I love it that like strength and autonomy and yeah that just knowing her own body parts yes yeah. it's protective it's and protective if we could break too. those narratives and in breaking them be aware like you said of the movies and the subtle messages we get mm -hmm. that will bounce off and be like that's not right <clears throat> you know you're my dream woman I'd be like well clearly we don't we're not aligned so mm -hmm. I need some time to warm up and I actually prefer you know, connection. I prefer to be fully engorged. I prefer, and once you know what your vulva can do and all the areas can do, you're like, wow, there's some really interesting, fun spots down here. Absolutely. That are, and the orgasms are different mm -hmm. that I'd had no idea about until later in life. I'm like, it's such a fun area to explore. So get your mirrors out, ladies, <laughs> and with your partners if you want, yep. and notice those parts and explore yep. those parts and be a teacher, you know, wherever you are in stage of life to your partners about all the different functions of this yeah, beautiful part you can do. But yeah, that movie was, or that clip you played was, was mind blowing. What, yeah. a, what a beautiful. It's one of my picture. favorites. Yeah. One of my favorites. Yeah. I think the name of it is actually your vagina is more beautiful than you think. Uh, and I think they changed it to vulva because it okay. is vulva, not yep. vagina. Okay, good. But I think originally it was posted as your vagina is more yeah. beautiful than you Oops. think. And then they modified it. Yeah. So I think it's your vulva is more beautiful than you think. It's a YouTube video. It's easy to find. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Okay. Really yes. Good. Research it. It's a good one to look at. Yeah. If you have any ick factor, shame, carrying labels from past experiences. It might be a good place to walk in to be like, oh yeah, they all look different. They're kind of like flowers and they kind of all yeah. have different, but the petals, they look a little bit different to each other and absolutely, but they're yeah, beautiful. And there's this, you know, interesting, the more and more I've been kind of diving my spiritual gear this year, you know, I, again, I, this is maybe again biased me, but I think the, our vulva area, you know, is such a, we only, we get to have that creation space in us. Like it's such an amazing close to God. Like, I don't feel anything else on the planet that's that close to creation of God than that part of our body. Mm -hmm. And so yet we've like locked it in a box and like have these shame things around it. And yet it can create access to divine, to divine, divine energy. And like, there's a whole other, yeah, mm -hmm. area of, of exploration yeah. that can open up and you now people say, Oh my God, you know, drag them for a reason. Probably <laughs> these are completely, <laughs> these are completely neglected areas. Of yeah. Our body. Yeah. yeah. If we never look at it. We never touch it. And then we expect to feel pleasure in it. We're going to yeah. have a hard time. Yeah. Or we just kind of go with the narratives. Mm -hmm. I guess that's what it feels like. I had a couple one time. Um, I've had more than one time, but interesting that this couple was adorable. They came to me for that, for sexual um, health, or they, sexual dysfunction, as they called it. And so I, you know, asked all the medical questions. They had no medical, they had done doctor stuff. And she just thought she couldn't orgasm. It was that was what they came from. This They'd been married for, like, they were like late 60s. Mm -hmm. And so I literally was like, can we just um, drive to the store? I took him I, and the guy sat in the car and he was embarrassed as hell. I just walked her into a shop and I was like, let's pick out some things in here that would interest you. That would help you explore with him or on your own. And she was like, red as a kite. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm not embarrassed. I'll talk about, I'll, I'll buy it. I'll pay for it. Like I'll walk in with you. And anyway, so we did, and we had these conversations and, you know, I went back in the car and told them what we bought and how they could explore together. They came back a week later and were like, she's like, I didn't know I could do that. I didn't know my body could do that. I didn't know I could have. I love it. It was amazing. I know it was I amazing. It. And I, I they were it. like, it's never too you. late. They hugged me. It's never too late yeah. to learn that stuff and to explore it. Yeah. Never. Yeah. yeah. And he was also as happy because he's like, I just, you know, she was like, it's just my marital duty. And so we broke, we, we took out all that stuff and layered. And I wasn't going to spend hours with him. I just was like, this is possible. There's nothing medically wrong. Yeah. So, and again, there's not just one way to orgasm. There's like 15 different ways to orgasm. So let's explore and here's some different tools. And to all those be vibers, there's also different wands and things to explore yeah. and parts that you can get to without, they're hard to get to with a penis or a finger. So let's 
Let's and doing it. the same thing over and over and over and over doesn't again work. isn't not going working. to get you there. <laughs> it's not working. Yeah, I just love them so much that they were so brave oh, to like that is not be taken by the hand and be like, that is brave. I know this is hard for you. It's not for me. So if you trust me, I'm gonna teach you some stuff. And they're like, yeah, okay. And they came back a week, you know, a week later and we're like, you saved our marriage. I'm like, no, your marriage is great. I just help you, you know, have fun yeah. in your marriage. And yeah, yeah, and never seen them again. It was like so oh, cute. I love it. Yeah, that is brave. Years that is, ago. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah years ago. So cool. cute. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um Gosh, what else? We haven't talked about all these other questions that we didn't get to here. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, these are more like questions about like, you know, sexual strategies, individuals and couples can you to address challenges. I mean, we kind of talked about these things already. Mm-hmm. An interesting thing that I'll implement sometimes, because when we talk about this, sometimes you know, introducing toys and mm-hmm. introducing things to help with orgasm is like step 25. Yeah. If we've got someone in the office who has not yet even achieved penetration yes. because of pain, it's called vaginismus. Yeah. Things are so tight that that's the problem and oftentimes are cleared medically. So okay. oftentimes there's nothing pathologically wrong with the vagina. There's not something pathologically wrong with the pelvic floor. Okay. It's just basically in like lockdown in protection mode. It's so tense that it's just not allowing penetration to occur. Interesting. So like that stress visual you talked about earlier. Yep, absolutely. And <clears throat> so some of them can orgasm externally. So clitoral stimulation and things like that can elicit an orgasm and still not have the like vaginal response that we're wow. looking for. And there's a lot of fear. Yeah. And it's really interesting to see that there has been some cases where they've actually wanted to conceive a child, mm. went about it via like a turkey baster method using small skinny syringes, kind of yeah. like a Tylenol syringe, yeah. semen insert, get pregnant and be able to birth a child without a problem. Wow. Mm-hmm. So is that, <clears throat> there's a very, very big trauma? difference between something going in and something coming out interesting there's a fear and apprehension there and right. maybe there was some trauma and unwanted contact at some point but birthing a child in that culture in that household in that in that person's mind was normal and safe and they could do it interesting mm. that's where we work together with a the therapist i'm gonna guess and if you have that yes. person in your office where absolutely you can teach them some of the pelvic floor yeah you know, stretches or gentle breathing techniques and they can do the yeah and then therapy for their teach them that the trauma. vagina is meant to be soft and it's safe to penetrate and that they can experience it without pain and slowly work on that tolerance to stretch and right. Yeah. And work on it. Huh. Interesting to, yeah, just the connection of the stress. I mean, it, it makes sense intellectually, mm-hmm. but when you talk about like the physical reactions, yes, the body's physically got that door shut. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, I've heard stories about, um, different and these stories I've heard online it's not necessarily specific to our labor and delivery but I've heard messages of nurses doing a cervical check during labor so they're inserting fingers into the vagina to check the dilation of the cervix and it's not a comfortable thing to yeah, have done it, typically yeah. <clears throat> and the person might have a trauma history might have a pelvic mm-hmm. pain history and they're responding to that exam right. with maybe a lot more yeah. pain or discomfort than someone else right. and they were told well if you can't tolerate this you can't tolerate delivering your baby oh which is clearly not true is not true it's not even a little bit true right. and there's a very big difference between feeling violated by someone yes which after someone makes a statement like that yeah, it's certainly extra true. It. Yeah. you're going to feel extra yeah next time they come back in the room to do it again yeah and then pushing that child out yeah but now you've just instilled doubt yes and, and fear fear and maybe shame yep and then they're more likely to not progress right there. yep wow okay so the people that are listening that are professionals um what do they look for and how like nurses even like mm-hmm. other therapists that are listening um what, what do we miss often this is trauma-informed care one-on-one okay Trauma-informed care 101. It should, it's not mandated. It's not mandated. I sought my trauma, even doing pelvic floor physiotherapy. Yeah. Trauma was not mandated. That's something that I went above and beyond. Wow. And you think with that, I know the job. it should be a requirement yeah. prior to even doing it. Um, it should be a requirement of labor mm-hmm. and delivery. If you're going anywhere near someone's genitals, it should be a requirement. Mm-hmm. If you're going near someone's breast, breast cancer screening, mm-hmm. it should be a requirement. That thing that they do, the, yes, that thing. Yeah. <laughs> if you are putting your hands on a human being, yeah. if you were touching a human being, it should be a requirement. Right. Because there is a lot of ways that you can trigger somebody mm-hmm. who's had a history of abuse without even realizing you're doing it. Yeah. 
And you should go into every interaction with a human as if they have that history. Because I can tell you one in four women being touched under the age of 18 is what is disclosed. Yeah. Right. That's what's reported. That's what's disclosed. That's not, that's not the true statistic. Right. Uh, You can't convince me of it. Yeah. Because if someone comes into my clinic in pain, I'm asking those questions on my intake form and I'm telling you it's closer to 95%. Wow. Of the people with pain. That you see, yeah. Of the people Which with makes pain. makes sense, yeah. Right? There are, and that's like, and again, and I ask them, like, have you ever disclosed this to a health professional before? No. no. Why? No one's ever asked. Right. So asking questions. Ask the questions. Or just assume, well, you go and do a public exam. Be ready for the, the answer. Yes, exactly. Right? I, t- I tell any student mm-hmm. under my care, don't ask the questions on your intake form if you're not prepared to discuss the answer. Right. Um, trauma-informed. Like, take the courses, do the extra homework, learn about it. Yeah empathize with it, be able to approach someone gently and carefully with like consent in the forefront of your mind at all times. Yeah. Um, to know that like, it's not about what you're doing physically. Yeah. If you are gentle and compassionate and trauma informed, that person is more likely to consent with you. Right. And to feel safe with you. Yeah. And then trust you to have a relationship to Mm -hmm. whatever the exam you're going to do, like the internal exam, right. To be like, do you want yeah. to hold the wand? Can do you want to put your hand or like let's how can we do this together so that your body can receive this this yeah. this test we need to get done? I get women in clinic that I can help them remove a pessary, which is that ring that your grandmother yeah. had. <clears throat> I can help pessary? them pessary. Pessary, okay. I can help them with speculum insertion. I don't insert speculums as part of my practice, but I help people tolerate speculum exams as right. part of my practice. So some might not have pain with intercourse, but have pain in a medical office. And right. again, penetration yeah but we've got that distrust maybe mm-hmm. we've got medical stranger trauma. yeah maybe we've got a stranger we're not aroused there's yeah. nothing with that um so i'll help them with a speculum insertion they're like why doesn't it hurt with you yeah but it hurts with this person yeah and i'm like well did your doctor like how much did you have two seconds with them before did they have you undress and lay on that table before they even came in the room and said hi that day right right i never get someone to undress like i don't get my you know how many people out there go into their doctor's right. office and the Here's nurse, gown, the nurse will back. groom them yeah put a gown on take your pants off lay down have you even met this doctor before yeah get your feet in the stirrups and you're just Here's like your feet in the stirrups and they come in and it's like how many students do they bring in no wonder it's uncomfortable <laughs> yeah right it's like oh my goodness like yeah so if yeah. you have someone listening as a patient um request informed consent request mm-hmm. i want to shake the person's hand first i like to see them i, I, yeah. I want to get a sense of their energy first before i i want to choose to build the consent to this procedure and know what we can do as a team to make sure that my body's comfortable absolutely and if you're comfortable to disclose hey i have trauma or if you're not that's okay too but just <clears throat> you know yeah but that's you know we're asking people this to do our things or just to have words to advocate yes. for themselves they should i know and we teach people yeah. to advocate themselves in labor and delivery but it's like you shouldn't have to yeah. and i'm sorry that you yeah, have to right after yeah yeah. It, yeah it should change and it it will change yeah it's just, well through conversations like this listening or if you if you know somebody that's struggling like go on with them as a support person mm-hmm. like you you know call in your your team of people that you have beside you yes you know talk to your yes. therapist your doctor your friend your aunt your mom whoever yeah to go in with you and be like this person can come and advocate for me in this, in this session and i'll ask permission if they would like to disclose the details of their trauma but you never have to disclose yeah. that a simple statement to a healthcare provider that so says many. i have a history of trauma yeah okay period. it's all you need you will likely have someone take a much more delicate approach with you right they should be taking that delicate approach anyways, anyways yeah they should but if you're nervous and you want to kind of make sure that that will in fact happen yeah that's it those simple words i have a history of trauma period yeah and, and empowering yourself difference. there i'm just thinking like how this can relate to life empowering yourself there to say i have a history of trauma and or i just expect to be able to meet the person first I'm going to set some yes. healthy boundaries for myself in this area of my life, which then I can actually do with my partner. Cause I've been saying yes. And I meant no about this life or with my, right. I'm starting to then empower myself because mm-hmm. the trauma part is what afraid of being overwhelmed and, you mm-hmm. know, and hopeless again. Yep. And so part of your work, part of your like work internally is to be like, I hear my parts that are scared and tight and I'm going to advocate for them yes. in all the ways that I can and all the relationships yes. that I can. So this, you know, starting this, this, mm-hmm. this conversation actually will help you lead into other conversations in your life yeah. where else you need to create some healthy boundaries that are loving for self yeah which are also loving for them absolutely the day. absolutely take yeah. the medical provider off the pedestal yes take them off the pedestal yeah, for your teammate you get to consent to who touches you who works with you you yeah. get to ask them to leave um you can say no to students you can say no to residents right. yes they're there to learn they can learn by observing yeah they don't have to you don't have to be that person for them yeah they can do that with someone else i go in students can do whatever 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Let, yeah. let me be that person. Yeah. How is that person? <laughs> let me yeah. be that person. That is like totally yeah, that. fine. There's people out there like that. Um, when it comes to yourself, like protect that energy, protect that about yourself. If you have nervousness and anxiety with a pelvic exam, you don't need two pelvic exams in that room because the student needs to do one too. Right. Absolutely. You do not need to do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Somebody else, will, somebody else will do that for you. Yeah. Medical yeah. providers. If you're asking consent for the student to do something, ask it separate with the student, not present. Yes, beautiful. Get them to step out of the room. Ask the patient what they think. They will be more likely to be honest with you. Yeah. This person's saying yes to their partner for 25 years. You're not going to say no to you, a stranger, likely. Yeah. They can't say yes to the person that they trust the most. And absolutely. Saying, yeah, absolutely. If I ask permission to have a student in my room, I ask that permission when the student isn't there. Yeah. First. And yeah. then I step out of the room and tell the student yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, such an important for, for, for professionals. And then I just go, that goes back to couples. Like if you're in a sexual relationship, relationships, whatever, um, to have these dialogues, like mm-hmm. it's meant to be a beautiful, fun, playful experience. It feels good for a reason. Yeah. So to slow things down and, and have consensual adult conversations with your partners that you're having, you know, sexual encounters with to be like, Hey, just checking in on your body and on your pain level and on your pleasure and your pleasure scales and where you feel pleasure and your way you feel desire. And just, which I, people are like, uh, I don't want to talk about that stuff, but yeah, you know, I'm when my sorry to embarrass my kid about when my son was, you know, moving into the stage of life. I had him and his girlfriend watch it. Was on Goop. I don't know if it's still on TV anymore, but Goop, which is Gwyneth Paltrow's show, she had mm-hmm. same like sex with Sue, whatever she was on there, and she had like vulva pictures, and she had you know pretty decent anatomy pictures of what it looks like and different ways to orgasm. And I was like, you need to go both watch, watch that show. Come back, tell me what you learned before you're going to engage in any kind of sexual activity. And they're both like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> like as we're talking about the as long as you both have a good experience. Yes. I want this to be a good yeah. experience so that you advocate for yourself yeah. for the rest of your life in yeah. all areas of your life. But this is a big one, like you said, that we somehow can advocate about what we want in our coffee or what we want in our breakfast table or whatever, but we can advocate for ourselves as sexual beings. Cause mm-hmm. again, we can go back into the history of like all the layers for history that have like put that in boxes for lots of reasons people pleasing tendencies and yeah yeah, not wanting to send food back at a restaurant because they got the order wrong yeah 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 Yeah. and let alone that i mean also like your cultural religious family all the all the things that you know has anyone even talked or spoken to you about consent yeah as a young age yeah right has you know, have you been forced to hug relatives? Have yes. you, you know, like has someone else's emotions been put before your own? Yeah. So that's only for procreation only. And it's dirty if there's anything else out of that or, and very yeah. like penis focused and penetration yes. focused and ejaculation focused and not right. Yeah. So yeah. true. So many layers of that for sure. Yeah. 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 It's a lot to unpack. It's a lot to unpack. Yeah. 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 I feel and like we need, need to, have to do it like a little bit at a time. Yeah. A little bit at a time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So for starters, people that are listening, let's start with like the idea of I think knowing your body, like mm-hmm. when we start off with like, get the mirror out, look at your body, watch that YouTube video they describe, which is really beautiful, mm-hmm. um, where they take the pictures of each other and, or they take pictures and show each other partners and the, and the, and it's a beautiful um, video. Um, and then go really slowly through your own kind of, you know, sensate focus of knowing if you, if you're single, then it's same thing. Yeah. They just start to feel mm-hmm. like, Oh, like what part? And after babies, like things changed for me. I don't know about you, but I was like, mm-hmm. these are now off limit. These are feeding kids now. So these are not long sexual anymore. Right? That's just, <laughs> maybe they once were, but now they're not. I'm breastfeeding right now. Yeah. There's a breastfeeding it's support bra gonna... and it's on 24 seven. Right? So <laughs> things change. Like you said, it's like to have that reset button. And, and actually as I age and grow, things change all the time. So your, your sexual being, yeah. who you are as a person, we had to change and grow. Your sexual being is going to change and grow. Yeah. We watched a movie last night with my, with my family that we were watching last night, some Christmas movie. And the grandparents were like flirting and going off. My daughter's like, ew, people still have sex with age. I'm like, I hope so. Hopefully. I hope it's better with age as far Hopefully. as I am. She's like, oh, yeah. no. I'm like, oh, yes. <laughs> I've had sexual education with yes. individuals in long, in like care homes. Uh, right. Usually um, like low, um, uh, support like they're living mostly independently yeah you know they might share meals with with their like peers and stuff like yeah. that and I've had to have sexual education conversation with them about like STD protection yes and if you're going to be having sex you don't know who else that person might be having sex right. with there's a lot of you in this complex be, and yes, yes you need to be like using condoms and you need to be protecting yourself and you know it's it's amazing yeah. to see enjoy, that. Well, let's enjoy. Be safe. Yeah. yes, but let's be safe. Let's yes. make sure that and also make sure whoever you're having sex with is also having the same conversation with their safety, their yes. health, and their you know all their stuff yeah. for sure too. Absolutely, so it's a good starting point. If this is a lot for you, probably is. Like Kelsey and I talk about this stuff, so it's not. <laughs> I think we can talk about 
yeah. lots of other layers, but yeah. Getting to know your body first, slowing things down, knowing your pleasure scales and where you feel pleasure yeah. and knowing that changes like knowing. Yeah. So I think uh-huh. I tell my couples, like, you know, do this on a regular basis, mm-hmm. at least check back in, check back in, like do that, <clears throat> push that reset button for fun at least once a year. Yeah. I like, do a whole reset once a year. Yeah. Technique that feels good on a Monday might not feel good on a Saturday. Totally. Like it, it could vary. Yeah. Right. So just be open, open dialogue. Yeah. 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 And then the second part, that's really important. I think you brought up today. That's really important is as professionals that we missed a lot of those cues. Mm-hmm. And so to slow it down and ask those questions, if you're not ready for those, for those answers, then, you know, check the field that you're working in. Did you need testament trauma background? Cause probably you need testament trauma training. Um, so, but asking those questions of any kind of trauma. And then again, as a professional treat everybody, that assume that they have trauma yeah. and go gently with them and you know, yeah. make, make sure that there's safety and security for that person you're working with. But um, asking those questions is really important. And as a person listening, shouldn't have to, but often we do advocate. And if you have a hard time advocating for yourself, find someone that will advocate with you because there are people out in the that will. Yeah. Right. You, me, yeah. um, family, friends, I'm sure I could go into those meetings and say, Hey, just, you know, she's going to have a hard time or he's having a hard time. There's some stuff here. And how can we make this a, this medical thing that has to happen? This, you know, you're pregnant and do this internal exam has to happen, but how can we help this happen? So it doesn't feel traumatic for this body. Absolutely. That we live in. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. I can't wait to hear the feedback on this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, I feel like podcast one of a few that we need to have so <laughs> so send us your questions send us your feedback we love this topic so we'll talk about it again and again absolutely it's an important one so yep i get i get the uh oh this question is tmi before they'll ask it oh uh, never no. it's never i've yet to be surprised yeah right <laughs> i've yet to be shocked by anybody's lifestyle yeah questions yeah yeah because that's a whole other topic we get into, but yeah. next time. But if you want to try to shock us, feel free. Yeah, <laughs> give it a go. I work at the gym. What happens? Also. Yeah, I got some crazy story. There's no way. <laughs> There's, I don't know. <laughs> give it a try. It's a challenge. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yes, I think I feel like I wanted to some other topics, but I feel like our audience would be like, "Whoa, that's a whole lot." We'll talk about like anal and other parts and other mm-hmm. things you can bring. We'll talk about that in another next podcast. Two on with us will be yeah. <laughs> The actual sexual activities that you can do to your pleasure. But anyway, <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much for joining us. We're really glad you're here with us on this journey. The best way to support this podcast is to subscribe and give it a five star review. See you next time. <laughs> this has been a Bread Dog Studios production. <laughs>